And good night, St. Lucia. Good night to all of you out there coming in at the right time. If it's Tuesday, it's time for keeping it real. I'm Norbert Williams, your host with you tonight for a loaded show. Boom! That's right, folks. There's so much stuff up here. I had to get a donkey to bring it up the hill. But let's not talk about that. Some people might be offended. You know nowadays how some people are so sensitive. But anyway, of course, usual shout outs because we have a lot going on tonight. Good night to you all over St. Lucia. I know people are always upset with me that I don't shout out the areas. PI, Piero, Viewfort, Chozelle, Canaries, Ancillary, Brooklyn. Well, Brooklyn is not in St. Lucia, but you know, Cap Estate, VG. I met a number of people during the week who say, you got to shout us out. But, you know, I'm sure you'll understand tonight. Is going to be loaded. Loaded, folks. Of course, got to say a special good night to those of you out there in the diaspora, where it's much colder than St. Lucia. And you're, uh, you're uh, listening or watching wherever you are. Special good night to you. Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, Long Island, Staten Island, Manhattan. New Jersey, Delaware, Baltimore, Maryland, the D.C. area. You know who you are. Special good night to you, Miami, Florida, and all of you out there in London, London, UK. So let's just roll right along, folks. Let's just roll right along and get into things. You know, yesterday, myself, as well as, I'm quite certain, Almost everybody who saw it, St. Lucians at home and in the diaspora, were shocked. They were bamboozled. They were whatever adjective you can find to describe outrage, horror. And you all know what I'm talking about. That young girl who was whipped and thrashed and abused for the whole world to see. I'm telling you, I, 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 looked, I must have watched it a hundred times because I wanted to get every minute detail of what transpired, what was said. And I'm telling you folks, I don't know about you, but if I had been passing at the time, I think it would be very difficult for me to contain myself. That's, what I'm, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Because the level of depravity that the aunt of this young girl displayed and the manner in which she beat her, there is no doubt in my mind that this is not or was not the first time. This is not something that just happens all of a sudden. This woman has some problems. And whatever help she needs to deal with those problems is one thing. But she has to be dealt with and be made an example of by the authorities. And the police should have spoken to her by now. There's no reason why they should not have picked her up. As far as I'm concerned. I've heard many people express a number of different thoughts and what actions they would have taken if they had seen this. But before I go any further, I have that clip lined up for you folks. Now, disclaimer, if you don't want to see it, if you're upset by acts of person on person, give you a few seconds to mute your TV, change the channel and you can come back in about a minute so with that said let's go to that video yeah my shoe in your feet you know i have to go to class in your you going in my shoe huh oh, 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 Before I box you, eh? Ask some of you in your. Huh? What the? 
you? That was that clip. That was the first one. There's another one, a little shorter. But you get the idea of it. What transpired there. I don't know. This is keeping it real. And I'm going to keep it real to you. In the typical St. Lucia way. Whether it's so or not, they don't know. But when you put yourself out there, you open yourself to interpretation. Wash pee pee. That's what I call that. Wash pee pee. That's right. Wash pee pee. Kila. Something is wrong. Because out of the blue, an angelic woman, that's supposed to be her aunt. Because the young girl wore her shoes to school, she proceeded to rain down licks on the poor child. For a pair of shoes. You think that's the only thing? Do you think or do you believe that this was an isolated incident? I don't think so. I think that child is abused over there constantly. You don't have to be a brain box to look at what's going on there. So many blows. And that girl does not run. She hardly screams. That child is a customer getting licks there. Or she's afraid of what will happen to her if she does anything. I'm telling you. <laughs> telling you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Why is PP? We are left to speculate on what could be the foundation of all of that. All of that. She didn't go ask somebody down the road to buy her a pair of shoes. Hmm? She didn't go steal a pair of shoes. And of course, folks growing up, you know, young girls, they wear their mother's shoes, they put on makeup, they play. How old could that girl be? What, 12, 13 years? Wore her auntie's shoes to go to school. She didn't go playing. She didn't skip school. She went to school. She got licks for that. Licks! That's all I'm saying on that. I ain't gonna say anything else. I ain't gonna say anything else. But, you know, let me tell you, folks. Let's move on. A little bit you know sometimes we talk about situations about what happens we project we come to conclusions you know you think about what the outcome of things will be by behaviors of people by statements people make and I'm sure you've heard me talk about it before. And I'm sure you've heard others talk about it. The sabotage of St. Lucia's image. The letters that are being written. The statements that are being made in the press and on social media. If we get back in the government, or when we get back in government, we'll review every CIP passport. Letters to the British about the appointment of Guy Mears as St. Lucia's High Commissioner in the UK, or to the UK. The statements by other individuals that they will write to investors and ask them not to invest in St. Lucia. The statements of people out there that Alan Chastney will be Prime Minister over their dead body. And the statements by others that if you touch St. Jude's or if you do this or if you do that, there will be no peace. You remember those statements? I didn't say them. I didn't make them. 
Other people made them. You know exactly who they are because you're in St. Lucia. You're concerned about what happens in this country. And you've heard those statements, those utterances. And as I've said before, what happens when you continue to encourage an environment like this? You keep saying those things. You keep making threats. Doom and gloom and consequences and repercussions and when I this and when I that, I'll do this and I'll do that. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> well, folks, we've talked about investors not wanting to get involved in a lot of what has been threatened here. They'll be leery. They'll be apprehensive about coming to St. Lucia because time is money and nobody wants to get caught up in court cases, in political brouhaha, unfriendly climate. They don't want to waste time. Apply, come in, get your project going. But, unfortunately, there are those who don't give a darn Sabotage St. Lucia as long as they get what they want, as long as they get their way. And unfortunately, folks, just as has been predicted by so many, I have the evidence. <laughs> you know, some people will say, I have the evidence, I have it. I have an email here, folks. An email. And that email was sent to an investor. Well, company who is going to be doing work in St. Lucia. They've dialogued with the government and there's an agreement, a contract. But even after that company received the contract, they got an email. In fact, the date on the email is the 18th of November. But I'm not only just going to read it for you, I want you to see it for yourself because you know there are those out there who say, oh, Sapavwe! Sapavwe! Put that email up on screen for the whole world to see. Now, if you can zoom in to the top there where you have the email information and who it's from, the sender and who it's going to. Zoom into the top of that email for me, please. Because there are some people at this time of the night, they don't see too well. Let's go to the top. Right. Now, folks, I have to let you know that some parts of this email have been redacted or they have been blurred out because I don't think it's necessary that persons who this email was sent to need to have those emails out there for obvious reasons. But look at who it says it's from. I'm only reporting to you what is out there. Okay? I didn't create it. I didn't dream it up. What is out there? From an investor, from a company that has signed a contract with the government of St. Lucia. And it says from, I'm reading plain English, St. Lucia Labor Party. In Lucia Labor Party at hotmail.com. And the date is the 18th of November 2019. And it was sent at 9.58 GMT. St. Lucia is four hours behind, which means that that letter was sent at two minutes to six in the morning in St. Lucie. Two minutes to six. And the subject, as you can see, I blanked out the name of the company, St. Lucia, and it says, in parentheses, FBI corruption, lawsuit investigation. Good day, mister. And I kept the name blank. We are the St. Lucia Labor Party and have been in existence from 1979. Now, pause right a second there. Obviously, that is not so. But I don't know whether it was fabricated 
to make it seem untrue. I don't know whether somebody fabricated or created a fake email account, but the email account is real because that's what it was sent from. I don't know. You know, some people already, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> but it is a fact that this email was sent. But let's go on because I'll tell you there's a little bit of, there's a bit of authenticity to this email and I'll tell you why. Let's go on. Our government have been bad English. Our government have been in power under Prime Minister and lawyer Honorable Kenny Anthony from 1997 to 2016. Our government would be re-elected in office in 2021 and would end, stop and cause all operations and payment toward the company blank. We are aware of the corruption and operations of your company with the present government and would be seek legal actions against your company operations. We are fully aware and have copies of your signed contract, contract IDSLU, and there's a contract number. And the contract number, folks, is real. So it is somebody who knows. Somebody who got the information and is being malicious. This is not a regular person out there on the street who just fabricated something. So it is my opinion that this is carefully orchestrated by a number of persons. It's not accidental. It's not just random. The persons know what they're doing. And there is an intention to it. So it says, contract, uh, copies of your signed contract with our legal system, with our legal team. We can safely assure you within the next 10 years, you will not be getting any payment for the services they will provide within St. Lucia. Please consider this email as a form of ceasing operations as no form on repayment, damages or refunds would be given to your company. We will cease all assets, I guess they want to say seize, all assets and equipment and take company officers to court. Similarly, to, pre to previous company illegal corruption on island like Lambert's company and its CEO. Our government is working closely with the US government and FBI fraud and investigative assemble under corruption government ministers which your company have entered into signed contracts. Similarly to your company, we have taken a stance against all corrupted practices and government ministers and would be taking them to the USA High Courts and would also be exposing their practices to the general public. Listen to it. I beg you to cease before you become part of the global exposure of international corruption and your company loses its positive image globally. Once again, please cease from your operations. Fail would result in lawsuit. Best regards, executive member of the party. Now, that's what it says. I don't know who it's from. I don't know who's fabricating that it makes it seem like it's from outside. But what I can tell you, what is here, this was sent to a legitimate company which is doing legitimate contract business with the government of St. Lucia. They have a signed contract. And reading through the body of this, folks, regardless of what anybody says, the words which are used, not elementary, the manner in which the thoughts flow on paper are not elementary. So it leads me to believe, and the grammar on there is deliberately misleading, trying to make you believe that it's an imbecile who wrote it. But one thing stands out, the contract number is a real number. It is a real number, folks. <clears throat> Philip J. Pierre, the leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, I'm putting this out to you, that this email is out there in the name of your party. Will you come forward 
and say that you and your party have absolutely no knowledge of this email. Folks, this is as real as it is, as you can see, or as you saw there on screen. Put it up on screen again, because this is directly from the inbox of um, an executive of that co company. Just zoom out a little bit there. Zoom out. You can see the email page is to the left. See all the uh, individuals, mailboxes and everything. Legitimate email. Okay? It's a direct screenshot of that email on screen. So think about it how you want, folks. Think about it. It's very, very sinister what these strange, these inadvisable statements. It's very, very peculiar what they can incite people to do. And many other things have been said. Watch it. The things that you say, the things that you say, can influence others. But nevertheless, that's it for now on that email. Of course, it was forwarded to the relevant authorities. The government is aware of it. It's, yeah, sent. At the measures that some people, the lengths that some people will go to, to sabotage St. Lucia. Think about that. Think about it. To sabotage St. Lucia. Let's move on. Because it gets even more interesting now. On Thursday last week, November the 21st, leader of the opposition, Philip J. Pierre, and somebody saying there's no sound on air. I don't know if you all could check that out. Philip J. Pierre is... Can somebody send me a message there? If you're hearing me. Philip J. Pierre appeared on What Makes Me Mad or one of those shows with Andre Paul. Two weeks to the day or two weeks after his previous appearance. And he talked about, okay, sounds on. He talked about privatization. Well, well let's hear Philip J.P. Let's hear Philip J.P. Can you explain to us the role and functions of the Development Control Authority? I'm bringing this up because lately we've been hearing in the news about developments taking place without DCA approval. So can you please educate us on the role of the DCA? And is this normal practice that people can just do things in terms of constructions and doing refurbishments and so on without approval from the DCA? I'm calling, I'm not calling. <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. Actually, um, that's a good question. In fact, there's a rumor. And let me make it clear. Let me make it clear. It's a rumor. So the people who want to hold me, don't hold me to it, please. If, if, if it's not true, I've said it's a rumor that the DCA is going to be privatized. It's going to be made a statutory board. That's a rumor. Now, that may not be true, but that's a fact. That's what I heard. So it may, it may not be factual. There's a rumor that the DCA is going to be either privatized or, be, or going to be converted into a statutory board. Anyway, let's move on. Can you <laughs> keeping it real? The leader of the opposition, a man who has been elected multiple terms, is reporting a rumor which he cannot confirm, which he says not to hold him to it, but he proceeds to BS people because you know what. He's trying to absolve himself from spreading rumors by spreading rumors. That's what he did. Oh, don't hold me to it. But there's a rumor out there. I mean, that's the level of, of accountability that the DCA is going to be privatized. 
สิมันใบอะไรโอกาส DAP OKEU there's nothing wrong with privatization folks but the context within which they use the word privatization makes you believe that it is a separate entity however there's no official word on any privatization there's been no news there's been no public statement nothing but Philip J. Pierre a few days ago chooses to report on rumors rumors but folks Statutorized, that's what he said. It could happen as well. But what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with statutorizing. It's to make the organization more efficient, more accountable, more speedy. There are a number of examples of statutory bodies that bear everything for the world to see, for the people of St. Lucia to see. That there's nothing wrong with being statutorized or as Philip J.P. wants to push privatized Wasco is privatized if you want to say it's a statutory body hmm? invest in Lucia is statutorized there's no problem with that the biggest example of a success as a statutorized body is what? Slaspa. And it's within the law to do that. It's nothing unusual. Philip J. Pierre presided over when he was in government, Wasco, Slaspa. They didn't disband them. They didn't find anything wrong with them being statutorized. They didn't find anything wrong with invest St. Lucia or St. Lucia Tourist Board or whatever the milli mélange of different entities that the government has what wrong with that? but during that same the same folks appearance and interview with Andre Paul Philip J. Pierre of course they like to attack that you know, direct awards. Oh, that's their whipping baby. They say, what out? Baiku. Direct awards. The government is giving direct awards. Oh my God, the sky is falling. Oh my God. Let's hear what Philip J. Pierre. Listen well, folks. I bring you a load of gifts for the season. Let's hear what Philip J. Pierre had to say about direct awards on Andre Paul's show last week. Roll it! We'll come back to that. Okay. We'll come back to that. So, let's move on. You know, live TV, you know, you gotta roll. Philip J. Pierre again, during that same interview, had to say, had to talk about Guy Joseph. Oh, absolutely. I'm not even going to paraphrase for you. Let's go to that video with Philip J. Pierre talking about Guy Joseph. Roll it. So talking about facts, uh, Mr. Pierre, what, is the, what are the facts surrounding uh, Mr. Guy Joseph and, you know, uh, allegations, you, allegations of invest, I'm glad you brought inve up, investigations into I'm my very Mr. Glad Guy you Joseph? Yeah. Mr. Joseph, I've been saying in Parliament with much bravado, you all investigated me. I defy Guy Joseph to find any document that says he, he, there's any, any investigation about him. Defy him. I defy him. I defy him. In fact, what there is, and I can attest to, there is an investment that is ongoing in, in, the, in the airport financing, a and etc. That is ongoing, which this government has stopped because they have not given the necessary information that was required. But there was no investigation on Guy Joseph. And I heard you repeat that, and I heard Russell say, say, say the same thing. That is not factual at all. There was 
the investigation was around the entire airport situation but not specifically mr joseph no it was not it has never been him it has never been him but he believes he can take on the mantle of bravado because he because he talks the loudest and he makes it and, and he makes the most noise but there was never an investigation in guy joseph i defy him to show it never There was never any investigation into Guy Joseph. I defy him to show it. Never. Let's keep it real tonight, folks. Let's keep it real. I don't know what kind of Kool-Aid was being drunk or what. Masav. So... Since Philip JPS says he defies anybody to prove that, I'll take him up on the challenge. Let's go to document number one. Person of interest. There it is. Let's go to the top of that. You gotta give the keeping it real crew everything. On top of that. Oh, that is the top, is it? It's higher than that. Okay. Re, but folks, this is from there. We go now. Zoom in a little bit more. You know, it's nighttime over there. Some people, their glasses not working too well. That's right. Attorney General's Chambers dated the 16th of December. Look at it on the left there, folks. 2015, and it's addressed to Andrew D. Finkelman, trial attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice, Criminal Division, Office of International Affairs. 1301 New York Avenue, Northwest, Suite 800, Washington, D.C., 20005. And it says, Re, request for mutual legal assistance in the matter of Antonio Asenza. Don't go too fast. Don't go too fast. Dear Mr. Finkelman, and folks, I have to tell you that I have redacted quite a bit of this communication from St. Lucia's Attorney General, Kim St. Rose. Because it's irrelevant to the point I want to make here. And just to let you know, what has been redacted will be dealt with on another show. I'm not going to give you everything one time. Oh no! Gotta keep you coming back for more! So well, let's go. Dear Mr. Finkelman, we welcome your offer of a telephone call and after reading your letter of October the 21st, 2015, we believe a conversation would be more beneficial together with this response. And then it says the request. With the benefit of your letter dated October the 21st, 2015, we wish to place on hold requests for number 1 to 7, 9 and 14. We wish to focus in particular on requests number 8, 10 and 11 that relate to the two key persons of interest, Guy Joseph and Antonio Asenza. What did Philip J.P. just say a while ago? Guy Joseph is not the focus of any investigation, any direct, any person of interest, nada. So let's go to the next page. Let's go to number two. Yes, under probable cause. Zoom in for the nighttime people, please. Zoom in on that there for me. Overview. That paragraph there. Yes, that's it. Bring it down. That's right. That's right. We have attempted to bring further clarity on the subject of probable cause. And that's in inverted columns there. And I would suppose that is a, a question that they ask them about probable cause. Not only for requests 8, 10, 12, and 13, but also for the entire case. We focus on one subject, material omissions, in one example. Okay, I'm reading the wrong thing there. Oh, and the overview. You can't see that. That's why. Overview. The St. Lucia person of interest is who? Guy Joseph. Who during the entire relevant time period was Minister of Communications, Works, Transport and Public Utilities. He was also a member of Parliament for Castries Southeast on behalf of the United Workers' Party. 
He occupied a position of public officer and we allege that he is subject to and in breach of the following law. And he says section 4 of the criminal code, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm dealing with here tonight is the statement by Philip J. Pierre, leader of the opposition, that there is no investigation into Guy Joseph. But under, I'll read it again. Under the overview section, it says, the St. Lucian person of interest is Guy Joseph. He didn't say Norbert Williams. He didn't say Peter Flo. He didn't say Coco Flo. He didn't say Maggie 212. Guy Joseph, person of interest. I, I don't think you can get any more direct than that to me. What do you think? But there's more. Oh yeah, let's go to the next page. Because you see, unlike certain people, I will show you the signature page. Go up for me, please. Mute. Allez, that's right. After the, the final um, paragraph there. After your review of this letter, we look forward to a telephone call. I would request that Mr. Lindquist, the investigator, be allowed to participate in the telephone call given his forensic investigations and intimate knowledge of the case. Further, I have asked Mr. Lindquist to send by FedEx a copy of the exhibits that are referred to and numbered in the letter and appendices. We thank you in advance for your valuable cooperation in this letter, in this matter. Yours faithfully, signed, Kim St. Rose. Attorney General of St. Lucia. But it gets even more interesting, folks. Come over here. I have more for you. Poor Fini. You know what? Let's roll back a little bit on that Philip J.P.A. Person of interest video. Just about 30 seconds from the end. Because I want people to hear it again. They may have forgotten. They may have come in a little late. Let's throw that up there for them to hear. 30 seconds from the end. Philip J. Pierre, last and week. That is ongoing. And in the, in the airport financing, E&M, etc. That is ongoing, which this government has stopped because they have not given the necessary information that was required. But there was no investigation on Guy Joseph. And I heard you repeat that. And I heard Russell say, say, say the same thing. That is not factual at all. There pause, was, pause. The investigation. There is no invest. You can take that down now. There is no investigation into Guy Joseph. This is not factual at all. Page two. The St. Lucian person of interest is Guy Joseph from St. Lucia's Attorney General on the 16th of December 2015, Kim St. Rose. Philip J. Pierre, as he has touted many times in the House and elsewhere, was the Deputy Prime Minister. He sits in cabinet. And even if he may not have been, maybe he was under the weather that day and he didn't attend cabinet, he wasn't around. He was back eventually as a minister of government, a senior minister of government, the deputy prime minister. He had to have heard about this. He deaf? He blind? He sued? He got boy? You answer those questions for yourself. But Philip J. Pierre says there's no investigation, but hold on! Not just, no, 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 folks, I can come better than that. Not only did the Attorney General write that letter, I have information before me. A cabinet conclusion, number 411 of 2012. Appointment to conduct forensic investigation and that cabinet had confirmed the appointment of Mr. Robert Lindquist for the purpose of conducting an investig a forensic investigation on behalf of the government of St. Lucia. The Attorney General, after consultation with the Prime Minister, will act on behalf of the government in this regard. And Philip J. Pierre 
member of government, deputy prime minister, number two, sits in cabinet, does not know about this. There are minutes from cabinet. Something as major as this must have been discussed with the prime minister. This is some serious business. And Robert Linquist, folks, listen here. Robert Linquist was paid almost three million EC dollars to conduct this investigation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Three million EC dollars to conduct this investigation. There's hardly any information in the attorney general's chambers and in my lady's chumba. Anyway. But hold on. It gets better. It gets better or worse. If you as an individual, not an employee, but a contractor, an individual who does work for government, if the check is $1,000 for your work or $10,000, you, it doesn't matter. If it's for $1,000, when you get that check, it's for $900. Because they tax that before you even get it. And if you're a corporation, it's corporate tax on there. But Robert Lindquist, being a foreigner, conducting business with the government of St. Lucia, is supposed to have 25% withdrawn from that check as withholding tax. But you know what, folks? Guess what? I bet you can't guess what. No taxes, no withholding, and there is no evidence of any withholding or any authorization not to withhold taxes from Robert Lindquist. Nada! Lots of questions to answer in that. But there's no investigation into Guy Joseph. But the person who was paid somehow magically. had no taxes withheld from the payment. Even whilst this government had gotten into office. A month or two into this current term, a payment or two was made to Robert Lindquist at Pearson Paddy Gouvernement. Pearson Paddy the Premier Minister. Hmm? Does that sound a little irregular? <laughs> Folks, does it sound a little irregular? Do we have that video now? Okay, I think we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back, folks. Back after the break. More action. Well, welcome back, folks. Welcome back. We had a little uh, situation with getting you the right file because I wanted things to be in sequence and we have everything lined up now. Got a backup of the file. You know, backup of the backup. That's right. Bash up here. Keep it real. Right here. We're going on with it. So, let's get right back into the action. And thank you so much for staying with us here tonight on keeping it real during this little break. So, getting back to Philip J. Pierre, leader of the opposition's interview on Andre Paul last week, Thursday. So, you know, there's been lots of talk about Direct awards, direct awards. Well, let's hear what Philip J. Pierre had to say about director. Now, now, hold on. You know, this government has been, they've been hitting the government about direct awards. Let's go there because Philip J. Pierre went there. So I'm going to go there tonight. Direct awards, Bali. Even Mr. Pierre, the argument is that your administration, when you, your party was in office, did the same thing in terms of um, um, issuing direct, direct um, contracts. We did. We, we never issued direct contracts in the magnitude and the, amount, and, the, and the amount that this government does. We never did it. All right. Utanli kuma. Ezotanli. Okay, that's what I want up there now, folks. 
So look at the years now, folks. Now what I want, I want to be fair to everybody, the opposition and the government. Now you see on the right of your screen there, a number of red dots. And you see a number of green dots. I didn't want to make the, the, the green yellow to represent the government's color, the United Workers Party, because some people would have difficulty seeing yellow and white, you know, tonight. So let's look at the first red dot and that is 2012 to 2013. The SLP came in, won elections in November, I believe, December 2011. So we'll cut that out, you know. <coughs> Philip JPS said, we never gave as many direct awards as this government is giving. So look at the four red dots there to the right and look at the years, 2012, 2013. 2013, 2014, 14, 15, and 15, 16. Four years for the SLP. I did the math for you folks. That equaled 426 direct awards. 426 direct awards, totaling $285.2 million. St. Lucia Labor Party Administration. Last one. Which average... If you divide by four, those of you who remember your maths at school, $71.3 million in direct awards per year, average. United Workers Party comes in in 2016. We're going to leave that, you know, leave it out. Free and clear, 2016, 2017, 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019. How many contracts? 355. What's the total? $183 million. Average, $61 million a year. Hmm? Philip J. Pierre. Play Philip J. Pierre again for the people to hear. Bali. So, Pierre, the argument is that your administration, when you, your party was in office, did the same thing in terms of um, um, issuing direct, direct um, contracts. We did. We, we never issued direct contracts in the magnitude and the, amount, and, the, and the amount that this government does. We never did it. Now put up the, leave the graphic up. Now folks, you can see the totals for each year, the number of contracts that were given, and the totals. Evaluate for yourself. Is what Philip JPS said last week on Andre Paul's show, keeping it real? Did he keep it real with the people of St. Lucia? Did he keep it real? I don't think so. I don't think he got his number. I don't think he has his marbles right. Mm -mm. Not at all. Not at all, folks. Any way you cut it, the number of awards average per year, the total average per year, no way. But did anybody give the SLP twaka for their direct awards like they're doing now? Oh, we never, and Philip J.P. is making it bad. Oh, he never gave us much or so much. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can take that down now. This is the words and the numbers speak for themselves. And Philip J.P. is a numbers guy. That's basic math. Can I add? You can, you can work that thing out on your fingers, you know. But let's move on. This is the real interesting part right now, folks. In the same interview again, Philip J. Pierre, folks, let's go. Let's go. He talks about buildings at St. Jude's are going to be demolished. Let's have Philip J. Pierre talking about the buildings that are being taken down. Let's hear him. And no one has told me, I have not been given any sound technical reason why two buildings have to be demolished. 
well hmm. he has not been given any technical reason well I'll tell you folks there has been a lot a lot that has been said about St. Jude's about the quality of the works about the horrendous workmanship about holes in the ground about narrow alleyways narrow ramps steep stairs low ceilings Tutkalte bagai corridors where you can't even pass with a wheelchair electrical work up the wazoo hmm hold on take your time take your time don't rush me tonight don't rush me don't a message parash water problems roof problems well last week i paid a visit to the st jude site and the bigger of the two buildings which are being taken down was still up actually it was on friday took the trip i didn't take the trip on a horse you know although dsh is so close i took a motor vehicle i may have heard a horse somewhere along the way i don't know you know but we i i took a number of photos and we have them here for you today bear patience with me it's quite a number of photos but i want you to see everything like i saw it i want you to be there i want you to see through my eyes through the lens what i saw to appreciate my analysis of the paralysis let's go with the photos now folks as soon as you come in there they had already taken off the roof but i'll give you the story about the roof hold on hold on Pantan. it's night time some people let's go back to the first photo right you see that therefore some metal beam or whatever you want to call it support structure now you see that lip at the bottom there that's where the the hang the hung ceiling rests so you go into an office and you see something like boards like you know chipboard or whatever it's uh, the ceiling and you don't see the electrical work and everything else that's inside of the ceiling unless you have to go in there to do some sort of work now i'll tell you in advance that that building had been there for a while and was not designed to have solar panels on the roof so whatever they did that building was retrofitted as you will see if you can see in the middle there they broke up the concrete to put conduit to run electrical wires and water and tooth culti bagai you see there in that square piece at the end butted up against the wall six nuts and bolts well it's supposed to be six can we zoom into that square piece on the end there almost almost soa folks now there were solar panels that were put on that roof and there was nothing supporting the roof it was a flat roof it wasn't peaked it was flat about 100 solar panels and each one of them weighing 41 pounds i did my homework i went to the website i have all the info for you to see you see already at the top there in the middle is missing missing a bolt let's go to the other photo now folks that's the other end in one of the rooms at the top a two-story building let's zoom in on that let's zoom in zoom in on that end let's zoom in again zoom in bali look at that folks in a l'hôpital gasa not one bolt in there now if you look behind if you look behind you can see the conduit the pvc 
that's behind that piece of metal there that's supposed to be holding up or supporting the roof under the hundreds of thousands of pounds of weight in fact 41 by 100 solar panels equals 4100 pounds plus all the other attachments and everything so anything between 4000 to 5000 pounds on that piece of roof and this is what was meant to prevent the roof from sagging no bolts and if you look you can see at the back then top left the pvc pipe there's no concrete there to hold on or to bolt that end piece okay next photo i have finished yet look at it again folks now I want you to see what this piece of metal which is supposed to support all of that weight including the roof look at what it's it's just resting on a one and three quarter piece of concrete that they just cast there there's no reinforcement no nada can you imagine a hurricane the weight of that time with people in there and that was the dialysis building where some of the most vulnerable people come for attention at the hospital. Next photo. Uwaikuma. Lot angle. You see that? It didn't even go all the way up. It wasn't broken off nothing. That's how it was under the ceiling. Or inside the ceiling. Look at the lip on the side there. The piece of concrete or, or cement that was cast. Huh? To support that. There's no reinforcement, there's no BRC, there's no metal, nothing. Just see Makila to support all of that weight, including the weight of that long 30 to 40 foot span of metal pipe and welding that's there. Next photo. Right? Look at it again. Next photo. Here's, let's zoom into that tape measure there. I give you all the information, folks, as I see it. Zoom in again and go up a little bit. You see the width of that there? One and three quarter inches. Go up a little more. Look, right above the, the, the tape measure there. You see a hole. You don't see any mark of any bolt or any nut or anything there. Nada. Mute. Mute, horsey. Look at that. Look at that. And all of that was underneath ceiling. Huh? Gade. But you don't know what was wrong. Next photo. Let the people of St. Lucia see. Next one. Look at this. This is one end piece. Right? That's supposed to be done properly. Next one. There's more for you to see, folks. A, a distance short of the same thing. Next one again. I've given you all the angles. Right. Now, this is a section of that same floor, which is which has a concrete roof that's the flat section but look at down there water next photo i'll tell you why the water is there let's go next photo you see that we're talking about mold in saint lucia when it rains the water is seeping through the concrete roof zoom in on that mutreo mold and the salts and everything that's coming through but that's a l'hôpital that's a l'hôpital right L'Hôpital, 130 something million dollars spent. Galeta, after 130 million has been spent, that's the status. Right? The hospital was 90% done, almost ready to open. Vesa, next photo. Right? Ha, ah, now that's another section. There's supposed to be some pump room. Below ground level, folks. Below ground level. But I'll show you what it looks like. Let's go to the next row photo. Look at that. Three feet of water in there. Water coming in through the sides of the walls and underneath. But that is a hospital that was 90% ready to go. And according to the member for library in the House of Assembly, on more than one occasion, man just go by chemical and get some bleach and clean that and is ready to go. Galita Plasla. Next photo. I'm letting you see it. I'm giving you all angles. Huh? Galitasa. And it's supposed to be a pump room. Now remember, folks. Remember. Supposed to. St. Jude's was destroyed by what? By fire. Put that, leave that in your mind. Let's go to the next shot. 
Now, on the right, folks, is where that pump room is that you just saw with all the water. You see that bush there? That grass? Right. That is, you see the window level? So, the bottom of that room is below ground level. Next photo. And that's another shot. Another angle. Right? Look at the room, the, that, that room there. You can see the white button out between the green and the, the footpath light there. That's to show you how low it is below ground level. Next photo. There it is, a closer shot. Right? Next photo. Next photo. That's a random shot there. You have another photo? Oh no! Pape! Are we there yet? Zoom out on that. Zoom out on that, folks. Well, that, folks, is a photo of one of the solar panels. Right? One of the solar panels. Let's go to the next shot. All the info is there. Ah, that's the shot I wanted you to see. From up above. Right? Look at the room. Look at the pumping equipment down there. A bad law. A bad law. In a hospital where you all had already spent $130 million. Rain falling. Huh? Water seeping in from the side. They can bar. Three feet of water there. And the men on, on, on site now, if you look to the top, you see like a little drain they had to dig out for that water to drain out of there. And the roof was removed. And if you see, can we get the next shot? Is there another shot? That lip there, that to the front, to the top, is where the roof was just leaning. With all of the top, you know, all the hoopla they made. All the experts they had on climate change. And they trips in all over the world. St. Lucia leading the way. This was hurricane proof. The roof flat on top of there and just nailed down. When rain falls, when rain falls or anything, what happens to that hospital? Steam room or water pumping room. What happens? Out of commission. So we're done with the photos. Let's go to the videotape. Let's go to the next video. Let's go to the video. And of course, folks, I wanted you to see for yourself because if you remember that there was a lot of demolition done at the old St. Jude's and stuff was buried, has disappeared. But everything that was removed from that building is still on site to be seen. Nothing was hidden. Nothing was buried behind the gas station. No tens, tons of debris disappeared. That's why you couldn't understand why $130 million was spent. Because it was built and broken down and built and broken down. So you build three hospitals. And you only see in one. There's the solar panels in another room again. And let's zoom in there. I wanted you to see what it was. You can see. Dialysis building. Uwai kuma. Esuwai. Usav. I bring you all the evidence. Keep going. There it is. Dialysis building. All for you to see. Let's go to the next video. <clears throat> Let's go to the next video. Ready? Well, folks, I present to you the evidence for you to conduct your own analysis of the paralysis. Okay, that other video is not playing for some reason. But you get the idea. It's basically the same, the same building just showing you the roof that was taken off, the materials, everything else associated with the solar and everything else. So we can come back to, to, to me here. Yes, there you go. There you go. So now, folks, I've given you that. It's keeping it real here tonight. Keeping it real. Mm, that's right. So another 
big talk that's taking the world, the region, St. Lucia, Dominica, by storm. Oh yeah, by storm. Is the Al Jazeera report last night. Diplomats for sale. Hmm. Diplomats for sale. Well, you know we had our thing. Roro may say, me, me, me Roro, eh? me Roro, eh? back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But I'll give you the piece of the Al Jazeera report that pertains to St. Lucia. You can go online and watch the whole thing. It's going to be playing for the next week. It's even on YouTube. So folks, let's go to that clip from Al Jazeera about St. Lucia. Roll it, man! ...a paid, will qualify people with no connection, no experience, but who are international criminals or who need, for some dubious reason, the protection, the shield of diplomatic immunity. And they buy it, which is a scandal, an international scandal. Jeffrey Robertson was involved when the abuse of diplomatic passports first became known. He acted for the wife of a wealthy Saudi. She sued her husband for a divorce settlement in the British courts. But Walid Jafali didn't want to pay. So how do you get out of a law that everyone else has to obey? Very simple. Sailed off to St. Lucia. And lo and behold, in no time, he was made the ambassador to the International Maritime Organization. And he never turned up for two years. He never turned up. And yet, when his wife properly made an application for money, he claimed immunity. Diplomatic immunity is a shield. Now, uh, that was obviously outrageous. A British court eventually agreed with his former wife. Diplomatic immunity didn't apply in a civil divorce case. St. Lucia featuring. It all started with St. Lucia. That's why it started in the Al Jazeera report. And there are still so many unanswered questions. Did anybody get paid? Where the money gone? What was done with the money? Where the money gone? I don't know. I know. Hmm. Oh, Where it gone? Where it gone? Who have it? So in keeping with all of this and all the questions that those St. Lucians were asked, let us now go to an interview. Newspin, Timothy Polion with St. Lucia's former High Commissioner to the UK, Dr. Ernest Hillier. Rather interesting interview. Roll it! What um, Dr. Jofali is getting in return is a St. Lucian passport. He has St. Lucian nationality, unlike Bill Gates and the so people he made no, reference I, I to. Does he, does he have St. Lucian nationality? Does, doesn't he have a St. Lucian passport? Jim, but they, they can be having a passport and having St. Lucian nationality. Okay, but doesn't he have a St. Lucian passport? Well, I mean, you'll have to have the official about it. No, no, no. No, no, but if you're having a conversation, you will our British High Commissioner. All right, to London. You are a commissioner to London. You should you should be in a position to answer that particular question, whether he has a solution no, passport or not. No. no, all I'm saying, what I'm saying to you, team, I was trying to explain to you, William, and let me answer to the point I'm making you. There's a difference between having a passport, which is to facilitate official duties, and necessarily having nationality. Okay, what's his right? status? I want you to make that point. What is his what status? Is his status? Uh -huh. He's our representative to the IMO. Okay, apart from that, does he have a solution passport? Against him, like I said, with the authorities are linked and can, can speak about those issues. No, I'm but, not sure it's in my yep. place. No, but if you're having a frank you. discussion, um, put it that way, Tim. Put it that way. Put it that way, Tim. Uh, I, I, I would see nothing wrong in Dr. Jafali or anybody who has official status 
been granted a, a, a diplomatic passport because it is to facilitate the conduct of their duties. Okay, but does he have a, a, a diplomatic citizenship passport? Again, again, I'm explaining to you. I cannot, I'm not the one to reveal that. I mean, they are the, the person who are best to make those announcements. I'm not going to announce all the people I know. I can tell you, I know a lot of people that have diplomatic passports and have had it for many years. It's not my case to make that announcement. That's what I'm saying to you. Okay, because I just, I don't want it to appear, sir, that Dr. Jafali is interested in Senusha to the extent that he does not want anything in return, that he's so altruistic in terms of his love for St. Lucia. Well, again, again I, I don't know how much I can convince you about that. But on the other hand, Tim, of course, if someone is going to invest, and as much as they're going to have philanthropic notions, they are investors and they think that they can make a profit because it's, not in, it's, not, it's never always entirely a charity. Somebody might say, look, an investment can bring, bring a return on investment of 10%, but in a country it might only be me 2 or 3%. So it's not a big money maker for me, but I wouldn't necessarily want to set up an enterprise where I lose millions every year. I mean, there are different levels of consideration one can give. You know, one can give a grant of $5 million and the grant is a big foundation of things can happen. People do make those grants in the world. Any final com comments from you, Dr. Taylor? Well, folks, lots of questions coming up again. A lot of questions have not been answered satisfactorily. Many, many questions have actions which were taken before. Have they continued to affect St. Lucia's reputation? That's all I'm asking. But then there was a letter. It was a little too much to have you reading so late into the night, so I will just skim through it. And this letter was put out. Civil society to organizations by Prime Minister or political leader of the United Workers' Party, Alan Shastney. And he said, you will recall in my letter of December the 16th, 2015, I raised grave concerns about the validity and circumstances surrounding the ambassadorial appointment of Dr. Walid Jufali and the undeniable harm it was causing to St. Lucia's reputation. Undoubtedly. But let us not forget Hala Jufali. You all remember that? It was a whole big to-do at government house. And they were saying, oh, how this would encourage travel and tourism between St. Lucia and Saudi Arabia or whatever. A country where women can hardly do anything. But they had a woman, Hala Jufali. No experience in nothing. Oh, by the way, just perchance, the daughter of Walid Jufali. Why, Kuma? Did she have a diplomatic passport too? Hmm? Hmm? Questions to ask. Anyway, at that time, I also warned that it could not have come at a worse time for the Citizenship by Investment Program and invited your support in calling on the government to appoint an independent and autonomous board representative of civil society. That annual financials of the CIP should be presented to Parliament and that legislative provision be made to permit the application of CIP funds to be used towards debt reduction and capital expenditure and not recurrent any self, not a recurrent expenditure. But you get the idea of this, folks. We're running short on time. Maybe we could take one call tonight. Let's open up the lines quickly and take one call because I know it has been long and some of you have been chomping away trying to get in on the action. So we'll take one call. If we could take squeeze two in, we'll squeeze two. Let's go. 450 Seven, seven. Let's do it. So, folks, it's not our doing here in St. Lucia. The expose, the focus on Dominica, the focus on diplomatic passports, the focus on corruption in the system. Didn't just happen overnight. It didn't just happen overnight. It's a serious situation, folks. And I'm telling you, the world is watching. That 
Al Jazeera report has rocked the region. I know for sure people in Dominica, Grenada, St. Vincent, throughout the region. And of course, all the diaspora have been watching and talking about it. It has been the talk of the day. We have a call. Good night, you're on the air. Let's keep it real. Norbert. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening to you. With all the corrections of all the lies of the leader of the opposition and all the accusations that have been going on with Alan Shastney saying he's a liar, I want to know if the, the Labour Party still feels safe going into an election with somebody like that. Let me give somebody else a chance. I know you don't have much time. Well, I, I don't know. That's a question you'll have to put to the St. Lucia Labour Party, but it seems to me that the statements that Philip J.P.A. made last week, the multiple statements, and there were many more, seem to have come from a very uninformed place. I don't know. I'm just saying. Pamwaki D. My analysis of the paralysis is that something is very wrong. It's not in tune with what's going on. It's not in tune with the reality. It's not in sync with the information that's out there, with the evidence, with the facts. As we all know them. Deputy Prime Minister at the time, was he not involved? He didn't know about the investigation. He didn't know about Jufali. He didn't know about Greinberg. He, what did Philip Jepia know? Because it doesn't seem like he knows anything about what happened. But he's making categorical statements. So something wrong. La, 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 la. Something not right. Anyway, folks, I think that'll be it for tonight. You've had enough, enough to digest. And I'm sure in the days and weeks ahead, more, especially right here on Keeping It Real. Remember those redacted pieces from the Attorney General? I got more for you next week, Tuesday. Don't you miss it. Right here, keeping it real. Hot 7, 8.30 p.m. Don't you miss it. That's it for tonight, folks. I'm Lord Williams. Good night.